Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast Season 14, Episode 107. He's Dave Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. And Dave, you know, I jinxed it. We had said on the Monday show, man, got the Quez Watkins news in right before the podcast. Great timing. And then about 10 minutes after I think we wrapped up, a bunch more signings came in. Quarterback Kyle Allen, defensive lineman Dean Lowry, and of course, Cordell Patterson, signing with the Steelers yesterday. So we got a whole host of new Pittsburgh Steelers for us to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Happy Wednesday. And uh, we we are we are not lacking uh, content to discuss today. That's for sure. So probably going to be uh, less uh, Brandon Ayuk stuff today. <laughs> <laughs> right? Should mention, I guess, well, you mentioned his name that the 49ers uh, denied any rumors or any inkling of trading Brandon Ayuk and said uh, John Lynch, the GM of San Francisco said that he joked about that with Mike Tomlin during the Friday pro day when they were both in Michigan. So if they were going to trade him, they're not going to tell you that, but their stance is from Lynch to Kyle Shanahan is that Brandon Ayuk will remain a 49er and we want to get a long-term deal done with him. Yeah. And that's not, not, not really, really surprising, but it does throw cold water on, you know, a lot of the speculation and all. And as we broke down or I broke down in that post recently of what's going on with the 49ers side, it's, it's very plausible from a cash and cap perspective that, that they get him done. So, uh, until other, any other, uh, flames or embers in ignite here, when it comes to him, it, it does seem like that's kind of a closed door, at least at this at this point in time. But stranger things have happened. All right. Let's talk about the guys who are Pittsburgh Steelers for sure. And let's talk about the most recent signing coming Wednesday, just hours after the NFL passed its modified adopted XFL kickoff rule changes that should encourage more returns. And really one of the biggest, most radical rule changes we've seen in, in quite some time visibly that we will see on the football field every single game. And so Pittsburgh signing. One of, if not the greatest kick returner in NFL history in Cordell Patterson, who's third all-time in kick return average, first all-time in kick return touchdowns with nine. 33 years old, former Falcon, Arthur Smith connection, but that is the signing Cordell Patterson. Dave, what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, we meet again. No, uh, <laughs> uh, boy, Cordell Patterson, we've talked about him you know, here and there over the years on the podcast, even though he's, you know, obviously never been close to being a stealer uh, before. Uh, I always contend, look, we all miss on, 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 on draft prospects, you know, nearly every year, but uh, on, on ones that uh, I tend to circle back to that. I have talked about a lot over the years, when it comes to, man, I, I really didn't get, have a strong evaluation or, or didn't get it on, on this player or that player. There's two that really, really come to the forefront, uh, on, on me. One of them is obviously Chris Jones. Uh, I, and really I was less kind of public about that on, on Twitter with him. Uh, I was more so when talking to, I think, you know, conversing with you guys in, in private chats and, and stuff like that. I never saw it with Chris Jones on the college tape, and I'm, I've recanted that, I think, before uh, on the podcast. And the other one I was a little bit more public uh, on, especially coming out of his draft year, was Cordero Patterson. Uh, I... I kind of wonder, you know, obviously he came out and was, 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 was originally drafted as a wide receiver. And, uh, I kind of wonder, man, is this guy going to be like two years and done, you know, in the, in, in the NFL? Uh, I just, I never quite saw it, uh, coming out of uh, college with him and all now a little bit to my credit, he's had to move around quite a bit, bit positionally. And he, he never really caught on 
you know, at, uh, uh, where his draft stock was a as a wide receiver. But I mean, if you want a testament of a guy, look, nobody plays in the NFL as long as Cordero Patterson has, if they don't have talent. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's a, a lot of the, uh, te and look, I didn't, I didn't go deep way back when, uh, on him on kick returns and all like that. And obviously, you know, right now that, 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 that that's one of his prime, uh, claims to fame, uh, there when it, when it comes to him, but you just don't hang around the NFL, especially in a manner that he's been able to hang around, uh, if you don't have talent and the kick return is, is at, at this point, obviously, and, and has been for a while, um, uh, a prime asset of his, but I mean, even going back the last several years, uh, he, you know, he's shown that he can survive in the backfield. He could be a, you know, depending on how much workload you want to give him and, 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 and the type of run scheme that you run, he has shown that he can, uh, function in that manner. You can move him around on offense and use him still some in the passing game, even prove that quite, I think quite extensively, even going back to the 2021 season with the Falcons. If you look at, you know, some of the highlights, uh, he had with him in there. So, uh, I think, and, and circling this back to, to the way you kind of, you know, open it here, <laughs> It's not, I don't think it's a coincidence no. that, that the, the new kickoff rule passes. And then hours later, we find out about Cordero Patterson, uh, agreeing to a two year, $6 million deal. So, uh, that's going to, at least on paper, be his primary asset to this team. And we'll, we'll talk obviously about the new rule here in a minute here, but, uh, uh, he is brought in to be one of those two guys back there in the back on kickoffs. And then, you know, on top of it, you've, you've, you have got a guy that could legitimately function as your number three running back. And not only that, you can have some fun with him, getting him on the field in some situations on offense there and utilize his talents that way as well, too. So uh, I think the biggest pushback that most people would give when it comes to a guy like Cordell Patterson is, oh, two years, six million. That feels a little bit rich, but if this guy provides for you what you hope and think he will provide on kickoffs, and if you can get any offensive contributions, what do you play? A hundred and something snaps or something last year for, for, for the Falcons. Mm -hmm. If you can get that out of him or, you know, 75 offensive snaps out of him, along with the kick return stuff and, and all like that. Yeah. You know, I, I, and basically we haven't seen the breakdown of this deal. This is either going to be a, a technically a one year, Three million dollar deal, or probably a one year three point two five million dollar deal. So, uh, once again, I, I tip my hat to Cordell Patterson. I I and, and I have done that over the years since mm -hmm. he's uh, been drafted and all. But uh, I like the fit, and at least on paper, I mean, it, 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 it's hard to take much issue uh, with this signing for 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 the several reasons that I highlighted. You said it well, Dave, and I, I agree with essentially everything you said. We all know his primary purpose and the catalyst for him being signed is to return kicks. The more interesting question, as you kind of alluded to, is what role, if any, offensively could he have when your number three running back behind Najee Harris and Jalen Warren? Is there any way that they're going to try to rotate him? Is there any risk or concern of Harris and Warren losing reps, even a small number of reps to Patterson, given that Arthur Smith tends to kind of go deep into the depth chart and play everybody. Or do you think Patterson's role and snaps could come at the expense of an extra tight end a receiver for a couple snaps per game? Where do you think that look might come from? A barring injury. I don't, I don't see him. Cause once again, what did he have? How many, how many offensive snaps did he have last year? And yeah, obviously they had 19, I believe. Yeah. Bijan, they had Bijan and all like that. And, mm -hmm. You know, we're starting to try to try to try to go at least in a little bit different, different direction and all like that. But, uh, uh, I think barring injury to, to Najee Harris or Jalen Warren, I think you might be hard pressed to get him on the field for a hundred snaps, to be honest with you. But I think 
much in the same light that we've kind of talked about maybe some things that the Steelers will try to do with getting Justin Fields on the field here and there. I think you can carve out certain times or situations during a game, one, two, three times a game, where maybe you can get Cordero Patterson uh, on the field. So if you were to extrapolate it out in a perfect situation where both Jalen Warren and Najee Harris are healthy, uh, I don't know, 55 times, 60 times, maybe a season, uh, in, in, in this upcoming season, getting him on the field for some offensive snaps, sort of, sort of feels like the ceiling. I was going to throw out 75 as a ceiling, but I, even that maybe seems a, a, a bit high barring injury, but I, I, you know, you, he will see offensive snaps. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a matter of. Are we talking 125 or 25? Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, anywhere in that range feels plausible. I'm with you, and I'm not, to answer my own question, not that concerned about Harris and Warren losing many, if any, snaps to Patterson. His Patterson snap count was greatly reduced last year when Arthur Smith and the organization in Atlanta drafted B. John Robinson. He had 144 carries in 2022, only 50. Last year was 177 offensive snaps. I misspoke with 19% of the time, 177. That was cut in half from the year before. So, you know, even Arthur Smith recognized, okay, you know, Robinson's there, Algiers there. Those are our lead guys. Pittsburgh knows they're lead guys. And Harrison Warren, they are established. They love that committee. I don't think they're going to do much to upset that apple cart. But I do think there's something to be said about the injury protection of that third running back. I've talked sure. about that quite a bit. You know, Pittsburgh. They've commonly in the past 20 years been a, a one workhorse back type of team. Now they're committee approach and they've been very fortunate and knock on wood with the durability and availability of Najee Harris, who's been probably the most durable back in football since he entered the league in 2021 and Jalen Warren. Those guys just simply have not missed much time. And what if one of those guys were to go down, just some freak injury? You want to try to preserve a committee to some extent, obviously. Harris or Warren, whoever's healthy, is going to become more the dominant guy, but you do want somebody with experience behind. And in 2022, I mean, Patterson averaged 4.8 yards per carry and had eight rushing touchdowns. So he, there may be some, something still there as a runner. So, yeah, I, I, there's going to be some use offensively, more minor, but obviously the signing is being driven by what he can offer as a kick returner, given that kick returns are kind of back in style in 2024. Yeah, look, and what you get on offense is just plus. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I think, and as you stated, you know, if you were to lose Najee or Jalen for uh, any amount of games, at least this guy has, has been there and done it and been successful. He's an angry runner. Boy, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of angry, uh, angry run scepters, if you will, <laughs> uh, in, 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 in that locker room right now. So, uh, do you want to get in a situation where Cordero Patterson's having to carry the ball for you 22 times a game? No. Uh, but, uh, when you talk about, uh, running some inside and outside zone specifically, he can do that for you. Uh, he, he, and, and, and when you look at the, the uniqueness of what we think that we understand the kickoff rule to be that, that the whole design of that forces the kick returner to read quickly and cut and go because people are a lot, it, 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 it more closely resembles an offensive play, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, that because of his ability, uh, his time spent in the backfield too, he's used to seeing, uh, those kind kind of things as well too. So, uh, that, you know, that is an asset I believe of his in the running game as, as well as his ability to read and cut and get upfield. He is, he likes to go North and South. Now he can get around the end still. He still has got the speed, uh, to do that, but you'll see him a lot in some of these, uh, counter runs and, and outside zone runs where he likes to be working himself forward uh, the, the moment he gets to football. He's good at yards after contact, or at least in certain situations that I saw on tape these last couple years as well, too. Uh, here's the thing. Hopefully, we don't have to get in a situation where we're talking about uh, Cordell Patterson having to play uh, and carry the football a lot, but he can do it. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. You can have some fun. Uh, 
putting two running backs on the field. Heck, you could probably have some fun putting three. <laughs> <laughs> what is what two's pony? What is three? Uh, sure yeah, what call that a stable. Uh, there you go. Yeah, but uh, hey, and and are we going to see a lot of that stuff? No, but at least you have the option. And what what is one of the things we rolled back to once Arthur Smith, you know, uh, came on board? You can have you you can make opposing defenses. You can give them a lot of things to think about. Uh, a with this offense, and B with with kind of the way this personnel grouping or you know personnel on, on the offensive side is, is is being built. Or much in the manner we talked about, Justin Fields giving opposing offenses something to think about in that manner. I would not be be surprised to see a a wiggle or a waggle here with with with, with Cordell Patterson to 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 make opposing defenses think about stuff that way, but. You know, it all rolls back to why this guy was signed and when he was signed, and 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 you know, it 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 it's stemming from the kickoff rule change. Sure, and just a quick sidebar: this is a really minor benefit to signing somebody like Cordo Patterson, and not not one of the top five reasons why you do it, but somebody that has been in the Arthur Smith system, experienced veteran, and can help explain that to Harrison Warren and probably to the offense as a whole. Just somebody who has been around the guy, understands the playbook, somebody that can almost kind of be a a teacher. If somebody has a question, I I think that's valuable for a team that's very run-oriented. So that's one small, but I think important benefit of adding somebody like him. Right, right. Look, I mean, once again, you know, the the only – the only real pushback that I think I'm seeing uh, overall from people is wondering if the Steelers paid too much for a guy over 30 uh, to to be primarily a kick returner. But I mean, if you if you flip the field a couple times, and Lord knows, look you and uh, you know you you posted this yesterday, and I tweeted out the actual play. Uh, you got to go back several years to the last time the Steelers had a kickoff return for a touchdown, and that was none other than Juju Smith-Schuster, and that feels like eons ago. Uh, and it feels like we don't see enough anyway of this football going out past the 40-yard line uh, on top of it. And according to the 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 the, the, the new the new kickoff rule is do- designed to make to to bring the kickoff return back uh in there so if you can flip the field something that this team has not done good enough job doing not only in punt returns but kickoff returns in general then he's going to quickly earn you know the three to three and a quarter million dollars that he's going to earn uh set to earn in 2024 yeah that was juju's rookie year the last Mm. time pittsburgh returned a kick for a touchdown that week 17 finale back when week 17 was the finale against the Cleveland Browns. And so Pittsburgh's one of six teams to have a kickoff return for a touchdown since 2018. Patterson has a kick return for a touchdown in seven of his 11 NFL seasons and holds the record with nine. Let's talk about Dave, this new kickoff rule, a lot of components to it, probably a little hard to to describe in audio form. There's a lot of great graphics and videos being shown by the NFL and others that can kind of, I think, you know, uh, not sell, but pass along the idea, convey the idea better than probably we can. But essentially, it's the XFL model where the coverage and return teams are five yards apart in opposing territory. There are going to be two kick returners in the landing zone from the 20 yard line to the goal line, essentially. Um, any uh, kickoffs that land directly in the end zone um, or, you know, that don't bounce in will come out to the 30 yard line. So the touchback is kind of a more quote unquote punishment and offensive advantage for touchbacks. Um, but the design is to increase the number of kick returns while reducing those car crashes. The big issue with the kickoff the NFL has been struggling with is you have, you know, guys running full speed into each other. And although things like the wedge and the wedge buster have been eliminated, you're still getting a higher risk of and frequency of head neck injuries because of these full speed collision so having them start five yards apart neither side can move until the ball either hits the ground or the ball is fielded by one of the return men that's when the blockers and the coverage guys can begin to move this rule does not apply for onside kicks by the way so that uh, is unchanged although onside kicks have to be declared and can only be done in the fourth quarter now for some weird reason that has been modified but i was listening to pat McAfee's show yesterday and they had on saint special teams coach darren rizzi and he said the expectation and belief is kick returns will increase by, I think he said, 20 to 40 percent or so. So he's, he's expecting there to be about 40 percent of 
uh, kickoffs to be returned this year as opposed to 20% last year. So about 60% touchbacks and 40% kick returns, still probably not an ideal balance, but moving in that direction and potentially more exciting returns, given that if you kind of get through that first line, you might have some space overall to work with. Yes. And look, uh, I've said this several times over the years. Plus I'm, I'm an old, old, I'm considered an old man now at the ripe old age of almost 56. Uh, I am a traditionalist at my core. I hate change. I hate when, uh, even the wrapper, the, the cellophane or, or the packaging on, on, uh, Charmin toilet paper is changed. I wonder (laughs) what else has changed other than that, I do not like those kind of things. I am a traditionalist when it comes to the NFL. However, comma, uh, the kickoff has really not been the kickoff play that I've grown up with. Uh, obviously, over the years, it's gotten you see in fewer and fewer of those things, more touchback driven. Uh, I do not like to see anybody get injured, uh, especially the, you know, uh, uh, concussion and head injuries and all like that. Uh, at this point, we have cut, we have gotten to the point where the kickoff is the time to go to the bathroom because <laughs> mm-hmm. you're, because you're not going to miss anything. It does not feel like so with that and the way this thing is laid out at least, and I, I believe several of others have said, you know, we might even see this thing kind of tweaked a little bit, uh, even, even, even through the, uh, through. I guess the rule is the rule at this point. I don't know if you're going to tweak the actual verbiage of the rule. So I don't know what tweaking, I think Brandon Bean was on some sort of interview to Bill's general manager saying something about tweaking or, or something along those lines. I don't see how you can tweak something that's been voted on with the language or anything like that. But even at its core and the way this thing's being laid out right now and, and the NFL operations is a great, has got a great video on this and all. Uh, I, I am, I am at least willing to give this thing a chance because anything that brings in a quote unquote play that has become something that nobody pays attention to, uh, a, a go to the bathroom moment. If you're able to bring back excitement to that and make it worthwhile, especially when it comes to the third phase of special teams part of the game, I think it's worth the least paying attention to and, 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 and giving it its fair shake. So, and we all, we obviously see the byproduct that the, 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 the Steelers think this is meaningful enough to go out and sign a player to a two year, $6 million deal. Uh, be, 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 be because of it. So I, I think that holds water in and of itself. So yeah, I, 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 I'm excited to see how this thing plays out. Me too. And it is a one year trial run. So if it's just a disaster, then they can scrap it and try something else. But what the NFL was running into was we have to do something to make this play work, or we're going to just eliminate the kickoff altogether, which I would have hated to, to go that step and right. eliminate the the entire act of the play and just begin with an offensive snap, I I presume. So this is kind of a, you know, I, w- I won't say desperation he, but they're running out of options. The fair catch thing was a terrible idea, which has also been eliminated where you, you can't fair catch the ball in the field of play and have it be a touchback. Now that rule is, is gone, which I think was dumb. And it was one reason why they're, the kick return numbers were half last year from 22 to 2023. Um, the NFL's goal is to get rid of the ceremonial play, the play that occurs where nothing really happens. You see that with kickoffs now. You saw that with extra points a couple of years back when they moved it from, what, a 19-yard attempt to a 33-yard attempt to at least make the chance of a miss a little higher than what it used to be. It's still obviously 95% plus, but it's not the automatic play that it essentially once was. So, Anytime the NFL can get rid of that ceremonial play, which is what kickoffs were becoming, I'm all for. I'm like you, I'm generally resistant to change, but I'm excited for this. I think it's cool. I think it's interesting. I think it's the best and frankly, the only way to merge between wanting more returns and more excitement for the play while reducing the number of, hopefully at least, reducing the number of concussions and head and neck injuries by not having that full speed collision. I don't know any other way that you could have gotten to that point other than how this rule is being implemented. Okay, Danny Smith Jr. Uh, got my gun. What, got my chewing gum over uh, here. Yeah, uh, put 
get some gum packed in your mouth here. Mm-hmm. Uh, some. All what, the gum. what does this do, if anything, to your special teams personnel on both sides of the kickoff? It's a really good question, and there is a little bit of unknownness, obviously, because of how just radical this is. I think teams will have to play around with it, but it it heightens the need for it. There's no question. Now, you mentioned in terms of the skill set of the kick returner, you're kind of looking at potentially more of a running back mindset because it's in some sense a running play. And I think Eric Galco, who runs the Shrine Bowl, who worked with the XFL when they were developing this, this model for their league, which the NFL has borrowed, has talked about that you may see special teams coaches treat this as a run play with almost pulling linemen in some respect because of the way this thing is kind of framed and and, and the formation is is grouped and created. So I think it changes the mentality that you don't necessarily need long speed and your best straight line runner as a kick returner. Now you need somebody that has the vision and lateral quickness and some power to break that one tackle and maybe bust through the, that initial wave and, and you know, create a big return. In terms of your coverage, guys, I don't know if it changes it dramatically in terms of, you know, needing guys who can, who can run and tackle. Um, maybe there's a little less element on the speed aspect of it. Maybe you put an extra linebacker as opposed to a defensive back because they don't have to cover as much ground, but it's just going to, you better have some good coverage people and some people who can tackle at least because if you miss one tackle, it might be a big return. Yeah. That was kind of where I was hoping you'd go on this is maybe this, I mean, I, I think it's evident because, because you're not having to run the distances, you know, you're not needing the, the long speed guy, the first one down the field, the Darius Hayward Bays, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, those, those kind of guys. However, uh, you know, you, you definitely want people that can tackle. So, and, and you probably want so a little bit bigger body, so to speak. So your, 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 your backup safeties and your backup, uh, 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 linebackers come into play maybe a little bit more in, in, in the assistant. Does it, does it reshape the personnel drastically? Probably not, but I do like how you hit on that. It's going to be interesting to see how some of these special teams coaches maybe have some fun with this mm-hmm. in, in the aspect of what you, and I didn't even think about that. You know, are, 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 can this be somewhat treated on in certain instances, maybe as a run play? Now, look, you don't have a, you don't know where the football is landing in a landing spot area. So sure. if you have something set up where, you know, maybe you are essentially kind of like pulling a, a tackle or, or, uh, 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 you know, so somebody pulling, so to speak, you know, if the ball's kicked the opposite direction, well, that, that goes out the door you know, uh, with it, within that aspect of it. But, uh, I, I think once again, this rolls back to having a skill set for a guy like Cordero Patterson. That's not only been productive in the old style of kickoff, but a guy that has spent time in the backfield reading holes and creases and be able to turn it up and, 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 and shoot through that, get, get yards after contact and all like that. So, uh, yeah, Long story short, it, it, it is, I, I don't know the way that this is going to go. It will be interesting to try to track the personnel involved on both sides of it uh, to see how that goes. Who, 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 who is back there on your, who is the second guy back there along with Cordell Patterson right now? A good question. And I'm not really sure who that was, who that is going to be. You know, you have potential options of a quest Watkins who's done some light kick return work, Calvin Austin, potentially back there too. Um, I, I had the idea. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but again, we're kind of in this new, just new system. What about a Connor Hayward? Who's got that. He was a former running back in Michigan state who returned kicks in Michigan state his first two years. Could you have him potentially do that as, you know, somebody that, that could be at least an option back there? I, I don't know. I, you know, could it be somebody else on drafted for agent who emerges? They'll have to kind of play these things out, but that guy might be important because I, I'm assuming that teams will be kicking away from Cordo Patterson. I, I would any chances to return the football. Yeah, I would imagine that, and that will be an interesting game inside the game as well, too. Well, you know, well, the Steelers signed Cordell Patterson to 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 return kickoffs, and he only has through eight games, five of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, 
uh, or, or, or something crazy along those lines. So that that will be an inter interesting element uh, of all this. Another thing I think that I read, too, is if the ball hits within the landing zone and goes into the end zone, you have to down it. Uh, you know, you just can't let it sit there. Right. And I believe if it's a touchback, then the ball's at the 20 yard line, not the 30 in that instance. Right. So, so that, that's another element. Let it roll. Right. That's another element to make sure you filled that thing and make sure everybody knows the rules so that ball just ain't sitting there and gets re you know, re recovered. So, uh, anyway, uh, what about just, just you got me thinking, and again, I think it's going to be really exciting and inter interesting to see how teams play, but you talk about the coverage guys. Could you put out there an athletic D tackle because that space isn't, you don't have to run as much, and it's it's even more of a pass rush situation than it was before. And I think before, anytime you had pass rushers, there was kind of a, a skill, set, skill set that could translate because you're defeating blocks 1v1. That, that's what pass rushing is, and with more confined space, that might become more important. We've occasionally seen defense alignment run down traditional kickoffs right. Brett, Brett Kiesel Henry Mondo did it I'm sure other teams have done it as well could you get somebody that was a super athlete deep tackle that could do that maybe I, I don't know I think it's just really cool to open up all the possibilities yeah well I mean if you have you know and how many offensive linemen might you have out there on the other side uh on a return team yeah. trying trying to block so I get it's a it, it becomes more matchup probably generated it could Again, I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but that's exciting because I knew how kickoffs were going to go before. They kicked the ball in the end zone. It's a touchback or they fair catch it, and the offense comes out. That's boring. Everyone knows what's happening. Maybe you get a return to the 23, but this is something radical and different, and I think it's really cool. Yeah, I'm interested to see how it plays out there. So uh, any, any additional thoughts on Cordero Patterson before we move on? Yeah, I think the big concern – not that it's a big concern, but the biggest concern I think you could argue is is not even the contract, but he, he is 33 and you do wonder, okay, how much juice does he have left? Um, you know, I know he doesn't have the mileage that a traditional running back does because he's not been a traditional tr traditional running back throughout his career. But you do wonder at some point Father Time wins out and are, is Pittsburgh getting him on the on the back end? Obviously they are, but how close towards the end of his career are they getting Cordero Patterson? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, Mike Tomlin, just, uh, what was it? 2000 and 22, 22 prior to the game, I think against the Falcons, he said, I'll talk about Patterson. What a dynamic return man. He is the field position component of play his resume, what he has been man. Needs no endorsement from me. It's just been nothing short of special. So, uh, that is his endorsement, which we did not need, according to him. <laughs> <laughs> but we will mention it all the same. I think the other concern which we brought up, too, is what if they just kick away from Patterson? Because you have to have two guys back there, and they have to be – is there certain areas they have to be aligned? Can they? Can teams not put them wherever they want to? They have to be on basically each side of the numbers. Is that, I think, a rule? I'm not entirely sure how, they, how it's structured. Yeah, I, I'll have to learn more about it. But if it is where one guy has to be on one side and you can't have, you know, kind of stack him or have them in tighter, then you know, if you're a kicker, you probably just kick away from Patterson the entire time. And now you have, you know, Quez Watkins or whoever becoming your lead kick returner, which is defeating the purpose of signing Patterson. Right, right. So that's one concern. But interesting to see how it all plays out. And again, to me, Dave, just last thought, what this signing does is very much in line with Pittsburgh's theme of, I, I wouldn't call their offseason – ultra aggressive in the sense of these high risk all in type of moves, you know, Wilson and fields are not, there's not commitment in, in, in obviously not, not the same with Patterson, but there's an urgency to it. And you see the rule pass on Tuesday morning. And by Tuesday afternoon, Pittsburgh assigned Patterson. That's an urgent thing. That, that's we're moving with a certain just demeanor of let's make these things happen and make these things happen quickly. And I think that kind of falls in line with how Pittsburgh's, approach the off season in totality. I view this as uh, them trying to play chess and not checkers game. Calculated. Yeah. Right. Or making sure, yeah, that they're not just getting caught with their pants down where the kick returner's back and they don't have one. And you know, they're just kind of scrambling in the entire season. I think it's a, it's a good hedge. If this new rule does create the benefit, the league, it hopes that it will. 
here's what Mike Garofalo from the NFL media uh, put out uh, yesterday after after Cordell Patterson was signed. His agent was in Orlando virtually waiting for the signal from the room. The new kickoff rule had been approved. It was this morning, and Patterson is headed headed to the Steelers in a flash. And flash, of course, is his, uh, his, his nickname. So... Um, seems like this might've been in the works for a little bit here and saying, just hold tight until we, <laughs> we find out the outcome of this thing and, and, and we'll sign you if it passes. It's also worth noting that Art Rooney said that the Steelers weren't really in favor of the rule and they had reservations about it, but they ultimately did vote for it. Not really understanding that point. Rooney said, well, once we found out it was going to pass, we just voted for it. I'm not really sure why you don't have to vote for it. I, my I think you answered it yourself in, yeah. in our in our chat that we had. My assumption is it's a sign of solidarity, so the vote doesn't look as fractured. There were officially right. three teams that voted against it, so a twenty nine three vote. But I guess Pittsburgh thought, well, let's just have it, you know, look like a united force as much as as possible. Why they eventually kind of caved and voted yes. All right, now Ross McCorkle has a film room up on Cordell Patterson this morning on the site for people yes. to see. So be sure to check that out. It's sticky at the top of the page. Let's go back to the first signing that occurred on on Monday, just to wrap up any final thoughts on Quez Watkins. That news broke before we began our podcast. We shed initial thoughts. Do you have anything else in terms of what Watkins' role potentially could be, Dave? Yeah, he better he better find himself on that kickoff team for start <laughs> for, <laughs> uh, for, for 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 starters there. Uh, limited route runner. Um, not, not all that great of a blocker most recently from what I've seen, you know, a contested catch guy, uh, in general, I think, uh, does a lot of things kind of okay. Nothing exceptional about him. Uh, I, uh, a a better, I, I think a better, obviously he's got the speed component to him. That is his calling card. I think to this point, still a guy that can, I think has more slot capability overall, but if you're going to play in the slot and your blocking's not up to speed, you, you know, you, you, you lose some, uh, some, some, some asset, uh, there to what he brings to you. I think much like Van Jefferson, he's going to have to earn a roster spot here. So, uh, overall, I don't view, unless he can, unless he's in more winds up being a little bit more impactful as a special teams player. I view this along the Van Jefferson lines of his addition, where it's not so much a needle mover uh, uh, when it comes to him. Uh, I I would have liked to have seen a guy at, at, at the value, and we don't know his contract value yet, but I'll be surprised if this isn't another veteran benefit contract when it comes to him. I think I would have liked to have seen somebody a little bit more uh, blocker, capable kind kind of guy in there. So uh the jury to me the jury's out on him. I don't think you write him down in pin as a 53 man roster uh guy, but the speed component is his most exciting thing. Look, it's not like he can't block, but it's just not one of his calling cards from what I've seen. I think th- I think there are two aspects to him. He he has slot experience and he has a speed component to his game. Yeah, that's fair. I just wonder, even putting the blocking aside, does he have any other tricks than speed? And Josh Carney did a film where and basically said speed is kind of his trick and isn't even always the deep threat that he's built and thought and hoped to be. Can he run routes over the middle? Can he make that tough catch in the slot? You know, slot is not always about the slot fades and the go routes. It's about running the the option route over the middle and sitting down versus zone, and making that tough catch on third and five to move the sticks. And I'm not saying Watkins can't do that, but I wonder, you know, how well he can do that. So my, my overall thought, Dave, is just looking at kind of the bottom end of the receiver depth chart. We know they're going to draft somebody and draft somebody within the first two days. Do you think all three of Van Jefferson, Quest Watkins, and Calvin Austin will be on this week one roster? Because I don't get that sense. No, no, I don't. In fact, you, you, there, there's a possibility. That we'll obviously see how this thing plays out moving forward from this moment in time. But there's probably a, a distinct possibility that two of them don't make it. Right. But the lack of special teams value, I know somebody will end up being that kick returner opposite Patterson. But Patterson is now 
in Pittsburgh's vision, the lead kick returner. Um, I just don't know what those guys are going to really offer in this Arthur Smith offense. And you wonder, maybe they keep one fewer receiver this year. I don't know. But in a Smith offense that you know, uses more tight ends than they do wide receivers and your depth not being particularly strong, maybe that's where the Pittsburgh goes. They keep five, for example, instead of traditionally keeping maybe six. And you, you wonder, okay, who is your Miles Boykin replacement? Or is that going to come from a different position or something else? Because, you know, Watkins and Austin and Jefferson are not going to be the coverage guys that Boykin has been. Yeah, look, uh, as far as gunners go, I think that'll come out in the wash with maybe a guy like Rush or something like that, you know, Darius mm-hmm. Rush or something like that. But, uh, but they're going to have to replace both of them if Boykin does right. not come back because Pierre right. is your other gunner and he's in Washington. Sure, sure. So that 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 will be something to watch uh, as things transpire and hopefully somebody will step up, either either a young guy on the roster such as a Rush or maybe, you know, maybe a special teamer comes in that's uh, – uh, you know, uh, uh, or a late round guy or something like that, that can, that can, uh, uh, punch his calling card as a gunner or something along those lines. Let's fo- let's focus back on the wide receiver room mm-hmm. though, uh, here, uh, look, if you're worried about this impacting the draft in a wide receiver position, don't, uh, that, that, that's still going to happen. And it's, it's very likely to happen within the first three rounds of the draft. Uh, there is still room and cap room and, and depending on who's out there, this, this team going out there and making even a a, a more significant wide receiver free agent ad right now. There is. And Tyler Boyd is still available, available. Some other names out there too. Although Pittsburgh was really pursuing that. I'm not sure why they'd be collecting Van Jefferson and Quez Watkins if they're keen on signing a, a bigger name guy but because, because they're veteran benefit guys and as always like to say <laughs> give me as many of those guys as, as, as earthly possible yeah that's fair that's a good counterpoint i mean there's no really risk or big financial tie-up or investment in it but you do wonder at some point okay you got kind of these you know backup type of guys instead of kind of adding more to that group let's go get that top draft pick and and that's going to be the bulk of your room. So yeah. I, I don't know how it's going to go for free agency. Maybe maybe they maybe they had somebody else. Uh, they certainly could, and the money dictates that they can. It's all about the fit at, the, at this point. But you would hope that it, the next one that they do add has more stickability. Is that a word? Uh, sure. Uh, 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 to him and 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 someone that you can more define as well. This 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 guy is going to have this role in this offense guaranteed. Yeah, you know? they they don't need another Jefferson Watkins type. They're right. good on those types of players. If they're going to sign somebody, it should be somebody that is cemented to making the fifty three with a clearer role. That's not the veteran, you know, benefit contract. And then obviously another one's going to come via the draft of some right. way, shape, form. Or, or something. Yeah. And should be top, top two days. I think somewhere day two is where I'm leaning, where Pittsburgh ultimately settles in at wide receiver, where they tradi- traditionally settle in. So that was the signing on Monday morning before the show. And then shortly after we wrapped up the podcast on Monday, Pittsburgh signing two more players actually was announced by uh, GM Omar Khan when he spoke to the media in quarterback Kyle Allen and defense alignment Dean Lowry. Both guys have kind of bounced around a little bit. Allen, more of a journeyman, Larry spent quite some time in Green Bay, but then spent 2023 in Minnesota, Taurus Peck in November to end the season. Allen, did Allen throw a pass last year even? Mm. What was his 2023 stat? And he had some time with Carolina a couple years back and saw decent starting experience. Uh, no, Kyle Allen threw zero passes last year. He was the backup to Josh Allen in Buffalo. So Mitch Trubisky and Kyle Allen are switching hats and rolls. Yeah, and I think even the film room we have coming on Allen harkens back to preseason last year, right? Some of right, it. Pittsburgh played Buffalo in the preseason last year. But yeah, Allen has 19 career starts, 12 with Carolina in 2019, through 17 touchdowns, 16 interceptions. Not a good ratio, obviously. Had four starts with Washington in 2020 and a pair of starts with Houston in 2022. All right, uh, not a lot to talk about there, other than we said it was. We said on this on that show, I think it's it's probably going to be someone along the lines of an Easton Stick or whatnot, and that's basically what you have here with 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 with, with Kyle Allen. 
Yeah, I always kind of use the boilerplate Trevor Simeon as that number three quarterback, somebody who has experience, but somebody you hope never gets close to a starting role. So this is essentially the equivalent uh, of that. But Pittsburgh, they prioritized and liked having good experience and depth, you know, first, second, third stringers last year. And although, again, you hope that Allen never comes close to seeing the field, um, just to have that as your third string guy with 19 career starts bring some level of comfort. Do you think this completely eliminates the chance to draft somebody? Do you think that fourth guy is going to be your classic Tanner Morgan undrafted free agent? I mean, I, I don't think that you can sit here and bet the whole house on this team, not drafting a quarterback late. I'm still not there at this point, uh, especially with us seeing a little bit of the, uh, the pro pro day activity and, the, and, 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 and all-star game kind of scuttle and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it, you know, I wouldn't rule it out, but I also wouldn't bet the house that they'll draft one late either there. So I, I think this could go either way. All we do know is that there will be a fourth quarterback at training camp in addition to these three, here's something else. None of these three qualify for rookie mini camp, uh, which is a, which is a good thing. Uh, oh, 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 overall. So, just, and, and not that it's a big, uh, big topic of discussion here, but they are going to need probably two, at least two quarterbacks, uh, in that room to function, uh, during rookie mini camp. One of those Two is likely to be a uh, an invite type guy, mm-hmm. and then the other one is likely to be either a draft pick or an undrafted uh, free agent. So I, I think that's where we're at. Uh, I think, and and it's not like they're just going to draft any quarterback late. If they do draft a quarterback, it'll probably be one of two or three guys that they have circled. Uh, and depending, obviously, how the draft goes, that that, that kind of thing, uh, there. So no, I don't think you can completely eliminate the possibility of a late round quarterback there, but in the same breath, it would not surprise me if they didn't draft one. Yeah. My first thought was, okay, they're set. They have one, two, three, no need to draft a quarterback. And again, I am generally anti drafting a quarterback outside the top two rounds, but I think it's still on the table. I think that Omar Khan has preached about competition so much. And Kyle Allen certainly is not a Mason Rudolph. We feel like, okay, he's known and in some sense proven himself to the team enough to to cement a spot that you could push him and if that four string guy if that draft pick goes to the practice squad then then so be it um we it, we don't know alan's contract but we're going to assume that's a one-year deal is that fair to say i would be surprised if this is not a veteran benefit deal in fact all these guys uh other than cordero patterson uh i have projected as being veteran benefit deals with $167,500 signing bonus. So if that's the case, it is worth pointing out all three quarterbacks in your room, assuming that Justin Fields fifth year option is declined, will be free agents after the season. Mm-hmm. Do you want to draft somebody and at least have a quarterback under contract or have maybe, you know, I guess if you cut him, he goes to the practice squad, here's our future deal, but get my point. Maybe you want somebody that uh, is at least a potential option for 2025. Now this team, I assume, you know, they're going to probably resign somebody. They'll go and see how Wilson and fields do. I'm not losing a ton of sleep about it, but it is unusual to have all three quarterbacks who are pending free agents. Again, assuming that fields option is declined. Right. And then it's something I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but something that you've talked about for the Steelers don't do a lot when it comes to, or they don't do anything at all when it comes to guaranteed money with their undrafted free agents. So drafting one guarantees you get a certain quarterback in your room, as opposed to having to play the bidding war with 31 other teams, which they will lose for any sought after undrafted for each quarterback. If they want one of the top names remaining, they will almost certainly not get that guy because of the uncompetitive structure they have with undrafted free agents. So yeah, I think, you know, Carter Bradley from South Alabama, they've shown interest in, I had the report on Jordan Travis today, who they, they've shown some interest in uh, a little bit overall. He's got the injury, obviously he's, he's dealing with, but I like Jordan Travis as a prospect. He's a really mm-hmm. interesting guy. So, you know, sixth, seventh round, again, I don't personally like taking a quarterback late. I don't think the value is really evident, but I think it's still on the table for this team. I agree. All right, well, All right. Let's, let's, let's talk about Lowry and somebody yeah. that even the moment he was 
harken back to a couple weeks ago when he was cut by the Vikings. Uh, I, I, I love playing the blues clues game, <laughs> no matter what the situation, uh, especially if I, I, I feel like I recognize a name and Lowry is a guy that came in for a pre-draft visit, uh, back in what, 16, 2016, I mm-hmm. think, uh, there. So immediately I had tweeted out, Hey, this was a guy that, uh, that, that the Steelers know, uh, you know, not obviously not knowing ultimately if he'd circle back there, but the moment that he, that Omar Khan announced that he was signed, it certainly makes uh, sense. And you have a film room up on him since. Yeah. To me, he sure he's like Isaiah Latimer, but older and maybe slightly more refined in part because of that age. Um, he's a classic, you know, base three, four defensive end that even played true five tech last year in green Bay. Uh, or in Minnesota, excuse me, he was with uh, Green Bay before. And you don't see too many guys that have done that. I think he's somebody that can, that's got good upper body strength, can can plug the run, can two gap, can occasionally penetrate in one gap, um, can you know be a little too tall. And a lack of length has always been a concern with him. I'm sure you're going to have a feature self joke in here. 31 inch arms is about as short as you're going to see for a defense alignment, especially one who's six, five, like Dean Lowry. It's very, very strange on the outlier. And so that, that can create an issue, but I mean, he's a base three, four end. He's played on the right side, which is where Kim Hayward's played and where they're trying to get, maybe get some relief from. He can't rush the passer. I mean, there's really no pass rush juice to his game. I know he had five sacks a year or two ago, but watching the Minnesota tape this year, a minor bull rush, but really nothing outside of that. I'm not even sure how he got the five sacks, probably some more you know, quality cleanup effort chase type of stuff there. So uh, I don't think we'll offer much in sub package, but to rotate in as a base defensive end, it makes sense after losing Armand Watts. Yeah. This is uh, your Armand Watts band aid. Yeah. And I think who would I consider the better player? I'd probably consider Watts the better player overall, but Pittsburgh did need somebody to replace him. Somebody who, if you can play the run, you're going to have a, a role of some sense to me. It's almost a, uh, a DeMarvin Leal replacement because Leal was only playing the little that he did in base packages last year as a, as a base right end. And he was just not very good. You know, just, just oh, he's on his way out. So that actually honestly made me become more the DeMarvin Leal replacement. You don't want to get in a situation though, where you're playing, playing Lowry 30, 40 snaps a game. No, again, just broke, you know, 10 to 15 per game. Again, very much a louder milk type of role. I think there's a lot of similarities in their game, even with kind of the awkward body type, louder milk's tall and lacks length for his frame. I think there's kind of some, some parallels there. Um, sub package, you know, he's not, should not be part of, a, you know, I assume Pittsburgh's top three right now. And, and sub package will be Hayward, Ogunjobi and Benton. So that kind of gets you enough there. And maybe Montrevious Adams a little bit as well, but he is who he is. Pittsburgh still has work to do. Still should draft somebody. They didn't get much younger here, which is not my favorite thing. Uh, Larry's about to turn 30 years old, and Okunjobi's 30, and Hayward's 35, so you're not really accomplishing that mission, but you are getting a niche run defender. If you had your druthers, you would have brought Armand Watts back, though, right? Yes, I would have preferred to bring back Armand Watts. One year, $3 million, I would have paid him that as opposed to paying Lowry the I would all assume is the veteran benefit contract. Uh, I will assume that as well too there, but I mean, you could do worse than Lowry. Yeah. Again, I think, you know, as, as that, if you, if you just use him where he's effective as being that base defensive end, you can live with that for a couple snaps per game. If somebody gets hurt, at least you have somebody that can generally stop the run. You know, remember in, what was that 21 where they just lost everybody, all the injuries happened and they just couldn't get guys who could even stop the run and just not play just kind of sound fundamental football. Lowry can do that at the least. All right. We thought they would address the defensive line at some point if they didn't resign Watts and they have done that now. Uh, you know, you, you could still add a night. I don't know who else is left out there in the same kind of type type situation as Lowry, but you can still definitely do that. We expect this team to address defensive line in the draft at some point. And heck, maybe you get some uh, undrafted free agent or something that comes in and makes some noise. Yeah, potentially. The The room is not finished, though, I don't right. think. And that's the uh, the takeaway, even with the Lowry signing. Right. And to recap, once again, I expect uh, Kyle Allen, uh, Watkin, Quez Watkins, and Dean Lowry all to be veteran benefit contracts. And I guess the biggest question is, will all three of them receive the $167,500 signing bonus? 
Give us an update on the Van Jefferson contract. The numbers are in there. And assuming these are the veteran benefit contracts you talk about, what's a rough update on Pittsburgh's cap situation? Yeah, the the Jefferson contract was exactly what I thought it would be, a veteran benefit contract with a $167,500 uh, signing bonus, assuming the Allen and Watkins and Lowry contracts all have the same cap number and assuming the uh, Cordell Patterson, look, there's only so, so many different ways you can divide up uh, uh, his Assuming it is indeed two years, six million, I view his cap charge coming in at uh, what did I write? Two point two five million, uh, give or take on either side by a little bit there. But I have this team now at twelve, twelve, a little over twelve point nine million in available salary cap space, and that does not take into account the workout bonus placeholder charge of nine hundred and seven thousand two hundred, which I do not believe has officially hit as of yet. If it has, if it has hit by now, you're lo- you're looking at a team that has just over twelve million dollars in salary cap space in real time as we sit here right now, which still should allow them to do the rest of their free agency work that they want to do uh, at this point. Uh, They obviously have the ability to restructure contracts. Alex Highsmith would probably be at the front of the line for that. We'll have to see what happens with the Cam Hayward uh, 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 extension and what that would end up saving if they do go that route. And then, you know, at this point now, I have added Minka Fitzpatrick to the somewhat plausibility that you could restructure. He would, in my opinion, probably come after Alex Highsmith uh, if they had to go and clear more salary cap space that way. I don't think I'm not, I I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's even guaranteed that you get to Alex Highsmith uh, and a restructure at still at this point, it definitely is plausible. Uh, and Minka's more of it feels like a break uh, break glass in case of emergency uh, type of deal with him. But uh, you obviously have the ability. You always have the ability to create more salary cap space. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, those are your, I think the way that you look at this, as we talked several times, you draw the line in the sand of where you need cap space for this, for that, for the other. And the fact that they have realistically 12.9 uh, 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 million anywhere from 12 to 12.9, depending on when the, uh, workout bonus placeholder, uh, charge hits, uh, you, you should have enough to function between now and, and through the backside of the draft. When do you see finality happening with Hayward's contract situation? Is that going to be a summer thing? Right before I camp have thing? no idea if I had, uh, if you had to pin me down, I would say you want to do something like that later on in the summer mm-hmm. uh, to to make a you know, make sure he stays healthy, you know, uh, but, but, you know, even it could happen anytime. Any, okay. We could get off this podcast, as we've seen in the past, and 10 minutes later, they say, we've extended Cameron Hayward two years and, and, and this. So, no, I don't don't have a good sense of actually when that will happen. And I assume the cap going up much higher than expected probably is giving them this time because had the cap come in at that what, 242 and a half number we thought it would. Something probably would have been done now with Hayward. I'm guessing. Well, either that or you 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 change your course of of, of some of these things that you've done. Maybe you don't. You know, maybe maybe the Patrick Queen thing doesn't happen. You know, it, it's hard to say how sure. all this would have transpired to reverse engineer it. Gotcha, gotcha. What are your expectations, if any, for the rest of free agency before the draft? Do you think more moves are coming? More significant moves? We'll call it multi-year deals are coming before the draft, which is now in less than one month. Alex, all I can tell you right now, uh, as far as, and and this is why I think cash projections are still very, very important in, in trying to refine this. Uh, assuming all these contracts come in the way I think that they're going to come in on these latest four players, that means that this team has essentially spent an additional $24.5 million in cash over what they started with their 53 with their top 53 prior to free agency 
going on. So if indeed, and it's a big if, it's all projections, they're on track to spend $40 million in cash, that still leaves $15 million up and beyond in cash that, that they could conceivably spend. Now, did I think this cash spending number would have been a little bit higher than it is right now at, at nearly $25 million? Yes. Uh, is $15 million at its core a lot of cash? Well, it depends on the type of player that you're going to go get. You just saw them go and spend what I, I deem is essentially probably $3.25 million prior to uh, 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 displacement on a guy like Cordell Patterson. There could be two or three more uh, additions that are like Two years, six million. Two years, seven million. Two mm -hmm. years, eight million. Uh, along in those lines. So no, I don't think they're done. I don't, however, think that I think you're done with the guys with the average yearly value of like seven or eight or more million more. Not saying that they can't, but it would have to be a it would be a specific player, uh, uh, obviously, at that point to to bust through that ceiling. They're not done. They're going to be more ads. They're going to be obviously more veteran benefit contracts. There still might be another two year six. That that seems it, to be the magic number. number. <laughs> Does Killebrew got it right? Uh, he got six point five, I think. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh. The uh, the safety Elliot was oh, Elliot uh, uh, was was two years six million. Cordell Patterson two years six million. That seems to be their magic sweet sweet number this year. It used to be two years eight million. Remember they gave Witherspoon right. and, and Wallace two years eight million. Other at, at, at two and six. What putting the the financials aside? What positions do you think they could or need to to bring in? I mean, at this point, will they even bring in a center, or will they just roll with Herbig and go through the draft? I think they got to bring in a corner at some point outside, but really somebody in the slot, either that's bringing somebody back or signing a true external free agent. Avante Maddox sure would fit that two year, $6 million. Yeah. It, it feels like right now. Uh, now, obviously the uh, Tredavious white, he's signed with the Rams. So that's out now. Uh, but it does, it, it, you're right. It feels like it might be slot related uh, in this situation or a corner in general. So I, I think, I think you could see that. I think you could see, uh, look, there's not much, you're, there's no centers out there that you're going to pay two years, $6 million for, but might Omar, Omar mentioned potentially maybe trading for one. And he's mentioned that several times throughout this off season process, whatever that's worth. So scan the over the cap rosters around the league of somebody making about $3 million a year. And maybe that's a, a, a sweet spot for trading for a center. Uh, additionally, why, like wide receivers still wide open in that room. We just talked about mm -hmm. it earlier there. I, the, the additions of Van Jefferson and Quez Watkins do not prevent you from adding a guy in a two year, six, seven, eight million dollar range. I just wonder, is anyone interested in trading a center right now and deleting somebody from the roster or maybe creating a need in for what I would assume would be not great draft capital in return? So could that be right after the draft where maybe somebody drafts a center, one of the top guys, and they got some veteran guy that you know is kind of being phased out and he gets flipped for a, a 2025 pick? That to me feels slightly more likely. But yeah, it's hard to see a free agent. I mean, they could bring in somebody, but nobody that's going to move the needle at all. But yeah, I think slot corner, they they can't go into the draft, which is nothing at slot corner. Again, I, I do think some other approaches, you know, they got Sullivan out there, you got Peterson out there. We'll go into the draft, see what we get and maybe, you know, re-sign one of those guys the day after the draft that Sunday, which is kind of what they've done in the secondary the last two years with Casey and Neil. So that that's probably their approach, but I'd still rather have somebody going into the draft to have something there. Yeah. I, and, and I think they will. Once again, they, the, the, the cash and the cap space both dictate that they're not done adding. And I don't think they're done adding uh, players more than veteran benefit deals on top of it. 
but it is probably going to be that two year six, six million Pittsburgh's that that mean that car meme. This bad boy can fit so many two year six million dollar contracts. That's the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. Right. It feels like that's that 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 that's the general direction. And once again, we'll, we will see more veteran benefit deals. Uh, uh, a couple more of those, I think, along the lines. But yeah, uh, slot corner, wide receiver, center. I mean, they could they they could use another veteran benefit experience, strong safety too. You know? It, yeah. It, it, I was it, thinking more tackle, maybe get a veteran tackle. Yeah. But, but once again, you're, you're probably looking at the little Raven Clarks of sure. the world uh, at, at, when, when it comes to that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's addressable. Yeah. I mean, it would be a yeah, Raven Clark or Trent Scott type of thing. Uh, that's you know basically what's out there and, and tackles are expensive, but uh, yeah, I think they will add somebody. I, I think slot corner and, and corner in general is where I'm, because I mean, what what is what is your cornerback room look like right now? On the outside, it's Porter and Jackson, and then depth on the outside is who? Darius Rush, Corey Trice Jr. Got a couple of the future reserve future contract guys there in the slot. That, that Luke Barku, right? He's he's, he's right. back reserve. back under contract. Yeah, one of the reserve future guys, Kalen Barnes, some uh, other names as well. But I mean, you need it's, that. It's you really need thin. to add to that room still. Yeah. It's really, really thin. I mean, how many, I was thinking about this last night, how many cornerbacks are on this roster right now who played defensive snaps for Pittsburgh last year? Porter, Rush, although he only played about 40, I think, and most of that came in Tennessee. Is that it? Well, I mean, uh, uh, J- uh, Jackson for another team. Oh, yeah, uh, I was saying, I was saying uh, in Pittsburgh last year, yeah. Just yeah. for the Steelers last year. You talk about we talk about the quarterback turnover, which of course was significant. They've almost turned over their entire cornerback room. And right. again, guys may come back. I think one of those guys will circle back, but that's been a big change too. Yeah, they 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 could stand to use some uh an outside guy in, in in that room in addition to drafting somebody. And then maybe kind of a good teamer, you know, whether that's bringing back a Boykin, although that's, that room gets kind of messy at wide receiver. Right. Um, or a corner, you know, ace in, in that respect, because these rule changes, I think, will heighten the need for for additional coverage guys. Punt team has always been important, but but kicks going to be more important too. Right. Dave, speaking of rule changes, let's mention some of the. And there's been many rule changes. I'm kind of trying to keep track of all the minutia of it all. But one significant one that was actually proposed by Pittsburgh that's now been officially adopted and will be enacted for 2024. The trade deadline has been pushed back one week. It'll now be November 5th this year the Tuesday after week nine, as opposed to week eight, there were many proposals to move it back two weeks to go after week 10. Uh, and so the NFL will do a one week pushback of the trade deadline. I like it. I mean, the math di- dictates with the amount of games that they have now that they, they, they do that. So uh, I, I have no qualms with that whatsoever. Me too. More time for teams to plan and decide. And if injuries were to strike more times to uh, more opportunities and a larger window to, to adjust. And I think the NFL would like to have their trade deadline be more robust. It's gotten a bit more active in recent years, but it's not obviously not towards the magnitude of baseball and basketball and hockey and probably never will, but a more active trade deadline will be one more marquee date on the calendar for the NFL to absorb. All right. What about the other rules? Uh, there's, there's some of them kind of get really, you know, kind of obtuse. The replays uh, have been expanded to look at more as what you can review, or is it the sky judge, quote unquote, that can review the the objective measures of was a quarterback hit in the head or was the quarterback out of the pocket on intentional grounding? There's an expansion of replay assist, which I'm always for. I always want to get the call right. So, so I'm good with that. What else is there, Dave? Uh, obviously, the hip drop is the big oh, right. Uh, and we, we already talked a, a, a little bit about that, so I don't want to go deeper deeper into that. Uh, it was interesting, uh, our Art Rooney and, and, and his thoughts on the on the hip drop. Yeah, he was all for it, and I think that, that echoed many of the thoughts of the league and Rooney citing the Le'Veon Bell injury that he had in 2015 when Vontez Burfecht uh, tackled him, and that resulted in Bell tearing his MCL and being out for the season on a hip drop tackle. All right. Uh, there was part of the bylaws that caught our eye. I think number six. Uh, I think specifically, right? Which one was that? I don't have the bylaws. Uh, number six. Uh, men's uh, a men's 
uh, article X uh, Roman numeral section 17.16 C to permit each club to place a maximum mm. of two players who, who are placed on an applicable reserve list on the business day of the, f- we're going, you can't, you can't accuse us of not going deep in, on, <laughs> on this podcast here. People might uh, fall asleep. If yeah. They're driving, so uh, on over. the, on the business day of the final roster reduction to be designated for return, such players will immediately count as two of the club's total designations. Now, I still want to get some clarity on this, but I do believe that what this signifies is that on the day of the on and before the four o'clock hits on the on the day that teams must cut their rosters to 53 active players is that if you have two guys that are injured that that are going to IR or you know active I guess you know reserve PUP or or, or something one of the reserve lists uh before you would have had to carry those two players on the actual initial 53 before sending them off to one of the one of the list. So my loose interpretation of this is that teams won't have to stick those guys on the initial 53. Mm-hmm. They will just have to on the hours before the final cut down of saying these two are going to injured reserve. So please allow us to put them there without having to carry them on the initial 53. Is that your interpretation of this? Yes, I'm pretty positive that is the rule change. You won't have to do the the dance of carry that guy that's injured for the extra day, the way that they carried Calvin Austin, you know, two years ago as rookie year for that extra day, then have that veteran circle back and kind of just that nonsense of, of procedural type workaround. So I think that's now been generally closed up again up to two players initially. Right. Also, my um, my headset's about to die, so I'm going to turn off my headset. My mic will work fine, but I won't hear you for about five seconds. And so, just let me know if you can uh, hear me whenever I return. So, just uh, you talk and fill up the space. All right. Look, at, at its core, I think uh, teams having to do that minutia dance around the 53 and the injured reserve players has been like uh, it's been. If if anything, it it it, it, it creates discussion bias of who's going to do the dosi do and who's going to be up and then out and and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, the fact that they are limiting it to two players to be those those designated players also prevents teams from having stockpiling I you know IR players. Mm-hmm. So I I like the fairness component uh, as far as that goes. So at its core, and look. Uh, you always wonder, well, if they cut this guy, will he get, you know, uh, it has to probably be somebody that's not does, you know, that, 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 that doesn't have to clear waivers. And do you have to have a wink, wink, shake your hand, you know, shake right. the hand kind of deal, uh, to make sure that he circles back. So at its core, I understand, I both understand and like the change when it comes to this. Are you back? Can you hear me? I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Am I good? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, It'll make our roster predictions easier than all this nonsense of, well, they're going to have to carry this guy on the initial. This is the initial 53. Hopefully those things will be a little less of a, of a problem for us. Right. Uh, I guess what a problem becomes is if you have three or four guys heading to IR that you intended to be on uh, on on your 53, what kind of dance dances mm-hmm. will you have to do that way? And if you have that many 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 people injured you are in a world of trouble anyway uh uh, when it comes to that so at its core i like this uh the other interesting aspect by the competition committee i don't know i'm going to have to think about this more to see if i'd like it or not the expand the standard elevation rules to permit clubs to elevate a bona fide quarterback an unlimited number of times from its practice squad to its active list to be its emergency third quarterback. Uh, a team like the Steelers who go seemingly other than one year, go out of their way to have three quarterbacks on their <laughs> 53 man roster. Uh, it kind of, it kind of spits in the face of that. Yeah. What is the purpose of carrying a third quarterback on your 53 with this rule? 
why would you not just carry two and elevate that guy every single week and use that roster spot for another position? Right. If you're I if did. you're going to go this route, of course it would take a CBA ruling to do this. Why not just expand the rosters by from fifty three to fifty five, which is going to come in the next CBA? I think uh, the the players would be foolish not to push for more active numbers on active rosters. Uh, yeah. as far well, that'll as be the trade off for the right. eighteen game season that I assume is right. also coming on that new CBA. Right, uh, but. Uh, yeah, I'll have to give this more thought. I understand why teams are pushing for it. I, I, I would be curious if the Steelers voted for this. I would, I would assume they voted against it. Maybe, but it's passed. And so, if you're Pittsburgh, I don't know how you could justify keeping three quarterbacks on, on your fifty-three unless you were scared about losing that third guy you know, or having to protect mm-hmm. him from a practice squad poaching or a waiver claim. But other than that, you're you only hurting yourself and putting yourself at a disadvantage by being basically one roster spot short. Um, if you're going to play this, if you're, if you're going to keep three true quarterbacks on your actual 53 man roster, right? Because you are purposely tying up one of your 53 man roster spots to be an inactive emergency quarterback on game day is what you're effectively doing here. Right. Which you can just do this, you know, the same by having that guy on the practice squad. So I guess you'd have to look at practice squad eligibility, but those things have expanded too. And you can put you know, multiple veterans on there. So that's not really a concern either. If you wanted a, a Kyle Allen or some other experience type of guy as opposed to a rookie. So we'll see. It'll be one wrinkle to consider. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's not been reported by many people. It's not been talked about much, but it actually is a pretty significant change. All right. We're not going to go through all of them here, but one other one that, 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 that caught my eye here by Buffalo to make the injury reporting rules for players who do not travel with their clubs to games away from their home city competitively fairer. So it sounds like you have to declare X player did not travel with the team. Yeah. I mean, I think clarity for those things is fine. Um, I, I guess that was an issue before. I maybe I didn't realize that was a, a, a problem of teams kind of trying to hide the ball by having some guy questionable and he's not traveling, which of course means he's not playing, but teams can still hold on to that questionable tag. So how, how will that be declared, though? I it don't won't be on the injury report. It, 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 will it just be will the team social media have to say something or I, I wonder how that gets enforced? I do not know. But uh, uh, I thought I would bring this up. Yeah, that's good. They need to bring back the probable tag. I'm so mad they got rid of that because everyone's questionable and you're never quite sure. Are you are you on the probable side of questionable or on the doubtful side of questionable? Are you truly questionable? And, and that still burns me up. Either that or you just you if you if you bring back the probable tag, then you eliminate the doubtful tag. Why would you have to eliminate the doubtful tag? Well, I mean, they're, you know, I, I think it adds a, a, a level of competitive balance then there. Either he's questionable or he's out. I don't know. I like the old, I like my resistance to change. Alex sure. is coming back. I just, the old one was, was cleaner and clear and you knew what, I don't know. I, it always just made sense to me the way they had it before. All right. But uh, anyway, it'll be interesting to see more of the language related to that one. Right. All right, Dave, we've heard from Mike Tomlin quite a bit um, in at the coach's breakfast and some of the other interviews he's done. He's spoken a bit more since we last spoke on Monday, but also heard from Omar Khan and Art Rooney the second. And so we'll kind of focus on what their comments are overall. Nothing that those guys have said is, is earth shattering. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. Rooney's comments responding to that, you know, poor F grade from the NFL PA survey, whatever that was a month plus ago and Rooney saying that that those critiques of the organization and of him have not been presented to him. And he called it basically a media media opportunity more so than something that could really be constructive. So interesting pushback from Rooney. Yeah. But the NFL PA is going to say, well, we want it out there like that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Their stance is to, to draw the public attention to it. And, and it, there's there, it, he's not wrong. There's a media component to it. But the questions become, you know, are these concerns valid and do you plan to address them? I believe when he said he takes them seriously, so he's not brushing it off. But it seems like his issue is that they're not being presented to him and they just get thrown out in the media. And he obviously gets criticized because of it. 
I don't know. Maybe the solution to this is to build a bigger suggestion box. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I mean, he's although he may have a point about critiques not being presented to him, I don't know how much they were or not, but he's now aware of the issues. It's been two years where they've been, you know, dinged for not having some of the, you know, family centers and childcare type things that many other organizations do. So if he wasn't aware before, he should be aware now, even if he's not being told directly by players, you know, what their concerns are. I I chalk this up to the politics side of the business. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, stuff that again, once, once training camp begins, nobody talks about it. it's really the off season fodder and more in-house type of stuff. But I, I did think it was interesting to see Rooney, I think, take issue with the, uh, the critique and the survey results. Safe to say Steelers will continue adding to the wide receiver room, says Omar Khan. When specifically did he say that? And hope, hopefully Quez Watkins doesn't, isn't the lone qualifier for that. Yeah, I believe that came after the walk-in signing that happened on Monday morning and Khan didn't speak, I think, until yesterday on Tuesday. So that came after. Now, again, how and where and who do they add is the big question. So Khan not exactly saying anything or shattering, but they will add. We know they'll add to the draft, and I think it's really more about trying to identify the who from the draft. Uh, we already talked about uh, the possibility of trading for a center from cons. So we won't revisit that. Uh, the policy of not negotiating new contracts during the season is just uh, is not earth shattering, just something he reemphasized. So there's not a lot to discuss there. Uh, the other thing that you wrote about, uh, and this really came with an interview, I think, with uh, uh, who was it? Wilkes. Uh, Steve uh, Weish. Uh, Weish, yeah. Uh, talking about new look coaching staff, cooking up cool stuff for Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. Yeah, it was kind of a passing comment, but I thought it was interesting when he talked about the new look quarterback room and really a new look offensive coaching staff, new OC, new wide receivers coach, new quarterback coach, etc. cetera. Uh, Khan said, quote, we're excited to have Arthur Smith on board and some of the new coaches confident they're going to find some really cool stuff for both those guys to do end quote. And again, I think there's certainly going to be some element of getting Justin Fields on the field as a package player to some respect, assuming he is the backup to Russell Wilson to begin the season. I agree. And we kind of already had some conversations along those lines of how many times that might look like, but the, the feel is that we will see, assuming Justin Fields is the backup quarterback, Probably safe to say a couple times a game might see him on the field. Going back to Art Rooney, he believes the team will not play an inter international game in 2024, which we kind of already was right. suspecting based on the schedule that's been laid out. I know Pittsburgh is still a possibility based on just the schedule layout to play the Eagles in week one, that Friday game in Brazil. But Rooney said he's not heard from the league at all about that. So he assumes that Pittsburgh is not in consideration. Um, so, and that'll also be a Peacock exclusive game that, that equals game. So all the best probably for Pittsburgh to not play in that one. It does feel like next year though, we're headed for at least one international game, whether it be Ireland or Mexico or, and obviously Germany was added as a, uh, what do they call that? It's a marketing uh, license yeah. expansion type of situation there. Yeah. I, I think it'll be Ireland or Mexico, probably Mexico. They, they never, they haven't played a game in Ireland in quite some time in the NFL, right? They did way back when. Didn't Pittsburgh play a preseason game Yeah, there? but boy, they sure did spend a lot of time uh, in the last calendar year of promoting that, though. So, oh, yeah. I, you know, uh, it's coming. I, it just sure. is, is it coming next year or the year after. Sure. But I, I, I think it's safe to say or as, as safe as to say as possible that this team will have an international game in 2025. I agree. It's been over a decade. The London game in Minnesota was the last time, which is when you think Pittsburgh, one of the more well-known, well-branded teams would have more international exposure. So I'm, I'm curious to see how long it's taken for them for them to do that. My guess, and it's a guess, is they will play in Ireland at some point, but I think Mexico will be where they'll play in 2025. I think they would have already been playing there had there not been those stadium renovations in Mexico City that delayed. I think there was no game in Mexico this past year. So I think, you know, had that not happened, Pittsburgh would have already had a game in Mexico, but I think that'll be where they go in 2025. All right. What about the Omar Khan and HBCU CU? 
Yeah, that was also the interview with Steve Weish. And, you know, for the last two years for the HBCU Combine and the HBCU uh, Legacy Bowl that Omar Khan and the Saints Mickey Loomis have been the only two GMs to attend. And Omar talked about, you know, why that is. And of course, knowing Bill Nunn and what he meant for the organization and somebody that kind of pioneered scouting HBCUs and how important that was to the Steelers 70 dynasty, um, kind of carrying on that, that tradition. Also, I think it does help that, you know, that con is from that area. He's from the Louisiana area and that probably helps just logistically maybe see some family, but, but con expressed the importance to, to being there to basically continue what Bill Nunn set out all those years ago. All right. Uh, a general takeaway from both Khan and Art Rooney circles back to the frustration that Rooney has of this team, not all, you know, not winning a playoff game. It sounds like everything is being done uh, to remedy that, that they feel that <laughs> specifically Khan and Mike Tomlin throwing him in, feel the urgency of needing to get over that hump. Right. Again, I think it's it's fair to say Pittsburgh has not been aggressive in the sense of these big, you know, put your plant your flag in the ground commitments, you know, but they've taken advantage of the unusual situations that Wilson had and Fields had. And again, adjusting on the fly quickly to the kickoff rule change with signing Cordell Patterson. And to me, that certainly speaks to a level of urgency for this team to win a playoff game and break this drought that has gone on for far too long. All right, and Khan talking about the quarterback room and all like that, circling back to the other conversations we've had about would would Fields had been on this team had Kenny Pickett uh, not uh, wanted a change of scenery. It it feels like based on some things that have all been said at this point, if you are to believe them, that this thing kind of transpired in a way they didn't foresee it going. They, it, it sounds like they had their eyes on possibly Wilson or fields to go along with Pickett. And once Wilson was added and Pickett decided he needed a change of scenery that initiated them getting back into seeing what it would take to get a, get, get fields. Is that, the, is that kind of your, your sits of things now that everything has come out in the wash? It is. I think that was not their intent, but once Pickett won it out and once he was dealt to Philadelphia, it swung the door wide open for Fields, and that's when the deal got started and obviously was finalized a day later. All right. Uh, anything else from that we're missing here from Khan, uh, Rooney, Tomlin to wrap up uh, the meetings? Comments. No, that that should wrap it up pretty pretty well overall. Let's do a, just kind of a quick pro day check in. The LSU pro day is getting underway right now. I don't want to call this a complete list because it's not being framed that way. But Albert Breer rattled off a list of head coaches and GMs who are in LSU right now, and he does not mention Mike Tomlin or Omar Khan. But league meetings are essentially over, and there are a lot of NFL guys there: Gerard Mayo, Dan Quinn. Dennis Allen, Antonio Pierce, and then the Commanders GM Adam Peters and new Chargers GM Joe Cortez are there. So initially, and this may change, but initially does not sound like Tomlin and Khan are there. A bit, a little bit surprising there. If indeed they're not held up by anything at the meetings. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe Tomlin on competition committee. Could there be something there? I think their business is done, but I don't know their inner workings, obviously. Um, LSU is not that far from Orlando where the league meetings are at. So again, this may change. Um, we are saying among the head coaches already, uh, on the ground. And so this may imply that there are others who are arriving at some point. You made the point, And I think you'll be proven right about this. We assume that Zach Zani, the new receivers coach will be there considering that, um, Malik neighbors and Brian Thomas will be there, I don't know how much they're working. I don't know if Neighbors is doing stuff or not, but you still would assume that Azani will attend. Barring both those guys already, perf- and we don't know, uh, both saying, well, I'm not doing anything but standing around. But even if they did just do that, uh, I'll tell you this, I'll be a little bit surprised if Azani's not spotted there. 
Yeah, you think they're going to they're have somebody of significance. I believe Ike Taylor said um, on the All Things Covered podcast he'll be there, although I don't think LSU has any super notable defensive backs that are going to be in this year's draft class. So um, not entirely sure what uh, he's looking for there, but he should at least be in, in attendance. And then obviously five minutes after this podcast ends, <laughs> Mike, Mike Tomlin and Omar Khan could be cited there. Yes. So uh, uh, just leave that open ended right there. Uh, Azani was at another recent uh, pro day. Yes. The Western Kentucky pro day. And one name that I think I need to get to know more and Steeler fans should as well is Malachi Corley, the receiver from Western Kentucky. Of course, he was brought in for pre-draft visit receiver coach at his pro day. Uh, Debo Samuel comparisons, what people are making. He's like 5'11, 225, thickly built, you know, yak guy, break tackle guy. Somebody that I think Pittsburgh is going to very much consider in that day two realm. Although I've, I've even heard Corley potentially be a late first round guy. So he might be a guy that's truly on the rise. Yeah. But if, if, if it goes back to the whole con con and, and, and Tomlin at the pro day, going to test that theory out. Maybe Yeah, my, that, that statement was kind of say, will he even be there for day two at this point to 51, you know, again, impossible to know deep receiver class. These guys will get pushed down, but somebody that's earning a lot of buzz. I mean, there was, there were so many, there were what nine receiver coaches at that pro day for Corley. Now I think it's because he didn't do anything at the combine. Didn't even measure. I think he had COVID. He was it was COVID. Or- yeah. They, they, so it, it, my understanding is he didn't do anything because of, of COVID and it wasn't, <laughs> was it vainness or, or playing right. games or anything like that is my understanding. And so I assume that's why there was really a large attendance there to to meet him, because I assume he did not meet with teams, maybe virtually, but I assume if he had COVID, he was not doing his 15-minute interviews or 18-minute interviews with teams. So I think they probably really want to get a chance to know him. And Pittsburgh is part of that group. So it was Azani and Dan Colbert, director of college scouting, attending two very much notable names. All right, Azani, we've spotted at two pro days so far. Not saying that he hasn't been at more, but with that yellow hat and beard of his, <laughs> <laughs> he's sticking out like you would think that we would have spotted him somewhere else up until the, now. There's obviously a couple more notable pro days upcoming uh, on, on top of the LSU, but we think that we've only seen him at the two, two at the Texas and the Western Kentucky pro day so far, right? Correct. And would expect him to be at LSU, uh, but we'll confirm that hopefully later in the Big 12 Super Pro Day, the players report today, they're being brought in groups. The first workouts occur tomorrow. And so we'll see how Pittsburgh handles this new Super Conference Pro Day. All right. Any other notable Pro Day position coaches that that, 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 that need to be walked through real quick? Not from a positional coach standpoint, but I do want to shout out, and we don't talk about this very often. How about Mercer? Is it Mercer University? Mercer College? I'm probably getting that wrong. Somebody can correct me. It's one of the two. Uh, But they have some interesting guys. And Pittsburgh sent two scouts there, Dennis McInnes and Bronson Williams. They are, one's an area scout, one's an an intern. It's not sending the the top of the totem pole. But there's some interesting guys there. Dev Harper, the receiver, is versatile and put up good numbers. Lance Wise, a safety, I think had five picks this past year. And then Dane Brugler tweeted out uh, a video of a corner there, Tavion McCarthy, who had a 44-inch vertical. And so Pittsburgh sending two scouts to Mercer, kind of interesting. All right, and we'll continue updating our Pro Day tracker when it comes to all that. And once again, we're interested to see who all shows up at LSU today. Is it the Washington State Pro Day today, too? I don't have the list in front of me. Uh, I assume that's probably true. There is the, the pit pro day is also today or Tomlin and Con and back home in Pittsburgh for that. I hadn't seen anything yet, but that's a possibility. Maybe one reason why they would not be at LSU. All right. Uh, it's LSU, Old Miss, Pitt, Tennessee, Wake Forest, Washington State, and offensive skill players in DB's report to the Big 12 pro day, but they won't work out until tomorrow. But yeah, there are a ton of big pro days today. All right. I think we have tackled about everything, have we not? Yeah, I think we're good to go. We'll get to a couple of reader emails and close out today's show. Let's start with Dan Devlin writes in. Good day, gentlemen. Great coverage of uh, this wild postseason. I have a couple of questions. If Steelers draft Buaga uh, or Fisher, 
Uh, is Dan Moore a trade possibility? If Moore does not start, can he be a swing tackle? Does he? Does the fact he is only left tackle limit swing uh, uh, options? If so, what is his value? If the Steelers, let's see, I know you do not like draft hypotheticals, but with this, with the needs and from the value viewpoint, does it make sense to approach Washington about swapping our first for their second early for their two early seconds? Curious about. If that would align in the compensation chart, uh, you could pick up a cornerback center and tackle in a second. Uh, regarding Iuk, I agree with Dave on the compensation being a third-round choice, although Dave mentioned this year or next. If the value is the third, next year's draft, is that equivalent to the fourth this year? I know less valuable normally, but not sure how much less. All right. Uh, we're going to pause the Iuk conversations for right now. Uh, for, uh, because a, I think people want us to talk about more people on the team as opposed to off the team. And we have beat the IU situation up, uh, quite significantly. So excuse us until there's more, until those embers get flamed a little bit more. It, to me, it sounds like it's a little bit wasted breath on IU there. Second, uh, Man, the whole draft hypotheticals. I, I I understand, Dan, why you're going there. And, and uh, I, I have not studied this. I'm not going to take time in this moment to look at compensation. I get what you're saying there about Washington, about maybe swapping our first for their two early seconds. Uh, I, I would have to look at it. Do you have any thoughts on that? He, he says it'd give you an opportunity to pick a corner, a center, and a tackle in the second. Any, any thoughts on that? What was he saying to trade more for? He Did said, he no, 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 this was separate. He says, this is a hypothetical oh. about, about Steelers sending, swapping their first for the, for, for, for Washington's two early seconds. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I misinterpreted that. Yeah. Again, as you said, Dave, hypotheticals are so difficult. You really don't know until you're about to be on the clock or on the clock and the boards in front of you and creation sees, you know, that wave and prior to the draft has been concluded. So you know, potentially, but it just depends on a million variables that the team doesn't even know until they're they're in the moment. All right. Uh, the first part here, uh, long story short, Dan, uh, I would I would be shocked if they dealt Dan more. And look, I know we I, I know he's got his warts and all like that, but he is cheap. No, he's not technically swing tackle uh, uh, versatile uh, uh, where you'd swip, switch, switch him over to the right side, but you would go under the assumption that you, the changes that you would make would be at right tackle. And then conversely, if Dan Moore was your starting left tackle when he went down, then you would switch uh, say Broderick Jones over there. And then, you know, you, you would work around the minutia of him technically not being a true swing tackle. Yeah, uh, that, that's my interpretation, too. I understand the question, and if they do draft a tackle in that assumption in the first round, it'll become more of a question, but I think Pittsburgh will value the experience, the depth that they have at left tackle. If somebody were to go down, if Jones were to get hurt, if he gets pushed over, then you have somebody like Moore that comes in without you know missing a beat from, from a scheme standpoint, experience standpoint, etc. So um, I think Pittsburgh's Inclination is to hold on to Dan Moore Jr. By the way, just two quick notes here. Uh, Malik Neighbors is working out at his pro day. He just jumped a 42-inch vertical and 10-9 in the broad, so Ooh. he's just crushing it right now. And I forgot to mention, too, uh, we have the post up on Steelers Depot. According to Ray Fittipaldo, uh, he was on the fan this morning. He casually mentioned the team did bring in Georgia offensive tackle Marius Mims for a pre-draft visit at some point. Don't know exactly when, but that has already apparently occurred. And so add Mims to that list of somebody that will be very much in play in, in the discussion for pick number 20. Okay. Uh, Garrett uh, from Roanoke, Virginia writes, and I know there's been consternation about trading away Deontay Johnson. I certainly was not happy about losing him. He writes, nor Pittsburgh's inability to acquire a true starting receiver thus far this offseason. I assume Pittsburgh will draft a rookie wide receiver in the first two rounds, he writes, as their other starter alongside Pickens. He goes on to write, however, thinking about this from the coaching staff's perspective, I wonder if they view Pat Firemuth as the most significant threat in the passing game next to Pickens. Could Arthur Smith's offensive scheme prioritize getting the ball in Moot's hands and thus lessens their urgency of having their top 
two flight receivers. This would also explain their willingness to deal Johnson. If I'm correct, we should anticipate Muth having a bigger year, biggest year of his career. Uh, here's my thoughts on Muth. A, he needs to stay healthy. B, you do need to you you do need to uh, make him a bigger component of the offense. And three, you're still going to need two wide receivers to throw out there on 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 a on a normal basis. Yeah, I, I get the point, and you're kind of seeing as things stand currently. Although things can and will change, the Arthur Smith experience, where you have one receiver who dominates the production, and really no other receivers that stand out in in a big way in terms of production. Again, in Tennessee, it was AJ Brown was the number one guy, head and shoulders. In Atlanta, it was Drake London, and then it was kind of just a committee approach, and tight ends got involved, and a bunch of receivers caught 20, 30 passes. Um, but yeah, I, I think this team does not want to be deficient at any skill positions. That If you add these quarterbacks in a year where you need your offense to go and produce, you don't want to be light there. And what if you know Pickens gets hurt, and then who are you throwing to on the outside? So yeah, the tight ends will be involved. I think in the red zone, especially, you're going to see uh, the ball be spread around quite a bit, including to Frymuth and Connor Hayward and Darnell Washington. But this team needs another option on the outside to have as much talent as possible to get this offense finally in gear. I think Garrett's cut, try, uh, uh, main assertion here is maybe, you know, was Deontay being traded away kind of correlated to Pat Frymuth? And my, my initial reaction would be no. Mine as well. And, and although I, Smith will have a stamp and you'll certainly see a blend, I think Tomlin in his comments during league meetings this week has made mention a couple times that, you know, Smith is adaptable. It's not where well, he's going to take a system and just force it upon what Pittsburgh has. You're, you're, you're going to see a blending. You know, Pittsburgh last year, they ran among the most 11 personnel and Atlanta ran among the least 11 personnel. I think it'll be somewhere in the middle in 2024 it's not going to be the most won't be the least will be a blend of it i think it's that's how you're going to see the smith offense get defined is um trying to have a little bit of both sides about pittsburgh has been doing things with their current personnel and then smith's own flair and stamp on the offense it won't be skewed so heavily one direction or the other all right ashley lawson has an interesting a couple of questions here from following the pro day circuit updates. Do you think the Steelers are trying to hide their interest in players more this year and provide less blues clues? No, he says no official announcements on top 30 visits, lack of position coaches at pro days, no reports on team dinners with Tomlin and con tenfold hat time. He, 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 he wonders, look, I don't, at its core, I don't think they give two craps about the Steelers Depot Pro Day tra tracker. <laughs> Although they are aware of it. Uh, the scouts, we've, we've talked to them a little bit. They're, yeah. they know we're looking. Uh, uh, for, that's first and foremost. Uh, as far as not announcing the top 30 visits, you see these beat reporters are going to report what they see. So they're they're barring get, get, giving, getting those guys in a back door in a disguise. Uh, they're not going to be able to hide that might that might they keep four, three or four of them away from us this year, possibly. Uh, but I, I'm not reading too much into that position coaches at pro days. Uh, that's, that's an interesting topic because a, if they're there and they're there to work out a player, we're going to see them nine times out of 10, we're going to find them. And specifically when you've got Zach Azani running around with a bright yellow hat on and, and, <laughs> uh, or, or uh, 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 Curry's very easy to spot when he's working out these guys. Uh, I wonder, I, I've, I've wondered this, Alex, might we not be seeing Carl Dunbar due to his more of he's, he's it's, it's harder for him to get out there and around. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he's got health issues or, or something else happening. Uh, we'll see if he's at, you know, the, is he at LSU today? He's an LSU alum. They got Mason Smith there. It would make sense. Uh, I kind of want to see all the pro days wrap up. I, I think generally speaking, I've not seen any decrease in in fewer positional coaches. Uh, maybe you're surprised by this guy being at one place or not being at one place, but we've seen Curry. We've seen Pat Meyer. We've seen Azani, um, although not a positional coach. You've seen like Taylor work out DBs, you know, so, you know, they're specifically there to, to, to work out those, those prospects. Um, positional coaches don't show up at eight places, you know, they go to two or three and not all of them are always at a pro day. I am a little surprised. I've not seen Grady Brown, although maybe we missed him, but 
But I think generally speaking, the positional coaches have been about the same as they've always been. Actually, I'll tell you this, and maybe it's just recency bias. Uh, I feel like we have made even more strides than what we normally make during this time of year as, as far as spotting just everybody in general. Yeah, we'll have to compare it, but I feel like we have a pretty good grasp. There's maybe one or two schools we didn't get any confirmation on, but I think, I mean, our tracker, uh, not that it's much of a brag, but I'll, our, our pro day tracker, I think is as thorough as any place you're ever going to see. I don't know if anyone else does anything. I, I know that some of the bills guys will, will focus on things, but in terms of really tabulating, you know, school by school from scouting interns, head coach and GM, I mean, our tracker is as complete as you will find. And really, it's just a big giant game between all of us. <laughs> is 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 all it is. Uh, it's a competitiveness of, and we even got Josh Carney involved in this thing now, where he's uh, trying to beat us to 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 to, to some of these there. But uh, we we do enjoy this part of the off season, and we feel like we've got to uh, have built a pretty nice list so far. So thanks for the email, Brian Tallini writes in. I won't be upset if we land JPJ or Zach Frazier in a draft, but after finally watching some tape on him, Graham Barton is my guy at 20, he writes. The technique, consistency, experience, leadership qualities, and listening to him in an interview, I think the guy has it all, he writes. My question is, does Kendrick Green's struggles in Pittsburgh make the Steelers? I think we, and this is from four hours ago, he writes this. I think we talked a little bit about that, uh, the whole Barton thing and, and, you know, not playing a mm -hmm. lot at center, uh, the project, he says, I know that was a Colbert pick with green and it's two different players and scenarios, but do you think it makes them hesitant because of this? Also, do you, do you guys like the player at 20 for us at center? I guess we'll see how much, uh, the Steelers like him at the Duke pro day tomorrow. Yeah. Look, the, we have the Duke pro day set to record whoever is there from the Steelers. We're almost guaranteed to probably find them. How do you feel about him at uh, 20. He's one of those guys I'm going to go back to, to kind of do more research on, um, probably this weekend or something. And by the way, or walk the mock mock draft is this weekend, Saturday, 8 PM Eastern time on my YouTube channel. So if you want to draft Graham Barton and help me draft Graham, Graham Barton, you can, can do that this weekend. Um, it, it's a fair, it's certainly a fair point in, in question to ask because Barton has not played much at center like green. He got, four starts there his freshman year and it's been a left tackle since, but he's not Kendrick green where I think he's this really unrefined raw kind of guy that needs a lot of seasoning. And Barton is bigger and I believe longer and I think just more equipped to play center. So it's a very interesting discussion. We should mention his name more in that center topic, uh, but the Duke pro day tomorrow, as the reader said, will be, I think very telling, although again, the big 12 pro day players begin working out tomorrow. How do teams handle that? That's kind of throwing a, a wrench into all of our blues clues. All right. Uh, finally, from Kevin Doubleday, since moving away from Pittsburgh, I don't get to go to as many Steelers games as I would like. But the last game I saw at the stadium, formerly known as Heinz Field, was a good one. The 2021 Steelers Bears Monday night game. The Steelers pulled out a close win on a late field goal. But that stuck with me from that night was the play of then Bears rookie quarterback. Uh, Justin Fields. He was exhilarating to watch, effortlessly escaping pressure, using his late athleticism to make plays with his legs and his big arm to explosive plays to receivers down the field. Leaving the stadium, all I could think was that I was terribly jealous that this incredibly fun, fun young quarterback was on the Bears and not the Steelers who were, who were facing quarterback purgatory with the looming retirement of Big Ben. I, I never could have imagined that just two and a half years later, he'd end up into black and gold. I don't know if Fields can develop into a full-blown franchise quarterback, but I do know that he's going to bring a level of excitement and electricity to the quarterback position we haven't experienced in a very long time. I think that the fan base, I think for a fan base that has slogged through five years of some of the most boring offenses ever seen in the NFL, that's cause for a little bit of a celebration uh, in a, a, a uh, of itself. Kevin, look, I, it, it, it is, it, once again, it's, this boils back. It's exciting in and of itself, what this team has done to this quarterback room based on what we've seen out of the quarterback room for the last several years. Uh, how much will, you know, it feels like Russell Wilson will have to implode in some way, shape or form for Justin Fields to get considerable snaps. Is that out of the question? No. Uh, 
But at least at its core, this team, you know, they, it's, I, here's the real thing, Kevin. I, and I, I, I've said this since, since, since Fields has been added. What's going to happen with this, this kid's contract from here until week one of the regular season? Yeah. Um, I know you've talked about could they do an extension, and that's possible. I still wonder what the urgency and incentive is for Fields to do it. But if the money's right and you frame it, you know, well enough, then then maybe that happens. But I think, Kevin, you said that really well overall. I agree with essentially everything that you said. We don't know how it's gonna go, but it, there's an excitement to it. And, you know, Fields will be up and down, he's gonna make his mistakes, but if he's the number two quarterback in camp, which he will be to at least begin, he's gonna dominate the backup Steelers defense. And in preseason games, he's going to dominate, you know, second stringers, even if it's just with his legs, like, which we know he can run, but it'll, it'll still be exciting and tantalizing to watch. So, I mean, there could be buzz off of that alone because, you know, I assume Fields is going to look really good this summer, even though it's a new scheme because just when he's going against, you know, rookies and backups with his talent, he's going to look good. I agree. And the uh, Alex Kazora training camp quarterback report should be tantalizing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm already mentally preparing to try to handle all the questions each day about each guy. But I mean, yeah, to to go from you know thinking about reporting on Pickett and Rudolph in camp when we began the off season to Wilson and Fields, it's a a big sea change. Well, you never know what we're going to be talking about on this podcast. And on Monday, I never envisioned we'd be talking about some of the things that we're talking about today. But I think we, within two hours, managed to. Have a lot of uh, content to talk about there. So uh, with that, Alex, anything to add before we wrap this up? Nope, that's everything. Be back on Friday. We will be back on Friday. And maybe, who knows, maybe even earlier. We'll see. Uh, In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, theterriblepodcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad-free version of the site, SteelersDepot.com. Hit the ad-free button up right navigational bar and follow the directions that way. Entertaining almost two hours. And until next time, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.